Good afternoon and welcome to this inaugural lecture for the Institute for Globalization Studies. The IGS is part of the College of Arts and Sciences under the aegis of the Dean's Office and was designated and designed to house the new GLI degree, a BA in Globalization Studies and International Relations with a major and a minor that we have just launched this fall with a core course, GLI 211, Perspectives in Globalization Studies and IR. With this foundational course, we're constituting a first cohort of GLI majors and minors who will be eligible to take further GLI core courses from this spring onward on various aspects of globalization with experts in different disciplines co-teaching them. It started strong and shows there's been a long need for such a program here at Stony Brook. For this new cohort and for all our SBU students and faculty, we want to create an intellectual community focusing on pressing global issues. And this institute is the very forum for it, as well as the opportune venue for globalists to convene and present their research to our SBU community and the world. Especially in this virtual format due to COVID, we can now extend our visibility to the world and invite speakers whom we couldn't otherwise be able to bring here, or at least so easily. This is, of course, not the case for today's speaker, Julie Livingstone, who comes to us from neighboring NYU and whom we had long chosen to be our keynote speaker for her important work on globalization and sustainability, and therefore to set the right path to where we want to go with IGS. Just like the GLI degree, the Institute is fundamentally interdisciplinary with a diverse set of faculty members constituting an advisory board, all globalists in their fields and drawn from various departments from the College of Arts and Sciences, respectively from sociology, Africana studies, history, women and genders and sexuality studies, English, Asian and Asian American studies, music, art and Hispanic languages and literatures. And this advisory board is by no means a static body. There will be a rotation and an expansion whenever needed so as to follow the new needs of the Institute and the degree it serves and to better accomplish its global mission. I'd like to take this opportunity to invite colleagues from all these disciplines, the humanities, the social and natural sciences, as well as fine arts, to reach out to us and suggest ideas of talks or any other initiatives that we could feature here at IGS around the theme of globalization and its impact on our disciplines and our communities. Welcome again to this inaugural talk and thank you for being here. I wish you all an enriching experience and hope to see you follow us up on our website, our social media and through our email communications announcing our future events. Thank you. What is my parable about? Well, our current predicament is an urgent one. The pandemic, the wildfires, the floods, the pollution, they've become our steady state and not our singular event. These share common origin in our global economic system. And that system is animated by the desire for a relentless consumption-driven growth. My parable calls that growth into question. I am absolutely not the first to do so. Instead, I'm joining Common Cause with many people around the world who have refused to cede our vision of well-being to a certain strain of economists. Nonetheless, I think that the <clears throat> argument here bears repeating because of how growth organizes space, extends across scale, and enfolds meaning. Growth is a post-World War II paradigm that has become so second nature that when people are thinking about a place in this world and how to improve it, immediately they, we, assume that economic growth should be the basis of that effort. So without us really noticing it, Growth has become an unmarked category, and I want to understand the implications for this sort of metaphysical, magical status that we've attributed to growth. As growth remains the common sense and so much is done in its name, 
a cascade of unseen consequences also becomes second nature. I call that process self-devouring growth. That's my term for the ways that the superorganism of human beings is consuming the planet. Wherever you are sitting right now, you are in a world that is organized by self-devouring growth. It's so fundamental as to be unremarkable, but it is quite literally eating away at the very ground beneath our feet. I could tell stories about it from China to Jamaica, but I'm gonna center my story in Botswana in Southern Africa where I've long worked. Botswana is a good place to think about the value of growth and its side effects because it's been so very, very successful. In fact, it's sometimes called a miracle, a Southern African miracle, for its ability to achieve forms of economic growth that are all too elusive for many of its neighbors on the continent. But from Botswana, we can see how even that success presents its own horizon as growth becomes self-devouring. In the four, first four uh, decades after its independence from Great Britain in 1966, Botswana had one of the fastest growing economies in the world. That's a growth that was based mainly on the discovery and mining of vast uh, mineral wealth, significantly diamond wealth. And that's been terrific for the people of Botswana in many ways. Far from being the resource curse that we see uh, in many countries of the Global South, the government of Botswana has built various safety nets and infrastructure out of their mineral wealth that they have um, carefully uh, shepherded and organized their position on the global market. As a result, the standard of living has risen there are publicly available antiretroviral drugs. There is an extensive clinic system and hospital system. There are old age pensions. There are vast, vast nature preserves. But as I've already suggested, there's also collateral damage as well, including an ever widening gap between rich and poor. Botswana is now the 10th most unequal country on earth escalating consumer debt, and as I'm going to talk through with you today, a set of unfolding environmental processes that threaten to bring the whole thing down. So my point here is not to call into question the value of what Botswana has achieved in terms of, say, public education or food baskets or health care but rather to worry out loud that these important achievements may prove temporary. What if the successes that we strive for are also our pathway to destruction? I'm going to explain what I mean by briefly unfolding three material metaphors into that parabolic shape and explain how they're connected in a web of self-devouring growth that shapes Botswana's present and its future. I've chosen three for explanatory sake, but there are many more examples I could offer if there were time. So let me begin. My first is water. Botswana is an arid place. There's very little surface water. The rivers are seasonal. So they lay there as dry sand during most of the year. And then during the rainy season, when the rains come, if they come, they experience a kind of arterial flow where water suddenly cascades um, through the otherwise dry riverbeds. Until the mid to late 20th century, Botswana, as the uh, citizens of Botswana are called, dug wells in the sandy bottoms of these riverbeds in order to tap into the water table and hoist up water for domestic use, for cooking, uh, and to water their cattle. The rain that fed those rivers and watered their agricultural fields was understood to be a sacred, sublime substance. People didn't just hope for rain. Political leaders, chiefs, were expected to produce it, and they hired rainmakers to do so. So I'm going to try to um, share with you, let's see, here we go. Um, this here is the rainmaker Raperi Letsebe. 
uh, as he was photographed by the anthropologist Isaac Shapira in the early 1930s. And you see him there preparing um, some of the rain medicines outside um, of uh, one of his houses um, in what at the time was called Bechuana land. At one time in Botswana, rainmaking was the essential political condition. And this is important. If you think about producing uh, uh, the climate in the ways that you need for well being, being the basis of political efficacy, you can start to envision um, what this political modality may reflect on our current moment, where that seems highly elusive. Rainmaking itself was a complex technology in which a pharmacopoeia consisting of material metonyms of the entire what I call animated ecology. In other words, the uh, widest iteration of the landscape in which the polity was located. Bits of plant, animal, and mineral life were gathered from across that landscape, each of which operated as a material metonym, a condensation or instantiation of that element of a world that worked together in unison. And so then bits of those, um, those elements would be processed, distilled, and mixed. Then they'd be put into a rain horn in which the medicines of the past preserved in fat and ash would be used to animate the medicines of the present. Um, I don't have time to go into the details right now, but essentially the rain that rained today was possessed by the past. Water was held by the ancestors. It couldn't be bought, it couldn't be sold, it could only be requested by human beings in the present who had to de demonstrate their worthiness to receive it as a gift. And people understood themselves to be future ancestors who would in turn hold that water in trust for their children. The moral worth that they had to evidence that was necessary to receive the rain as a gift was evidenced through a whole host of rules and practices by which people were prevented from polluting the land and also from taking more than their share. It required that people obey their chief who mediated that host of rules and practices, but it also required that the chief obey the people who held the potential to undermine or humiliate him, or less often, her. And the historical record shows that this complicated technology often failed. Often those moral conditions were impossible to achieve. Well, the British colonizers did away with rainmaking and the rest of the Tswana public health system they replaced it with Christianity and technoscience. They introduced a water boring machine and began to drill wells in key sites. Now nature in this instance was no longer an animated ecology that worked in concert. Instead, it was an object with limits to be overcome, domesticated and quantified through technology. But how did something so fundamental as water the substance of life itself shed those broader metaphysical dimensions of its power such that its value was reduced to that of economic and public health metrics. And what are the implications of this rationalization of rainwater? Well, at independence in 1966, the new post-colonial state made piped water the cornerstone of a new radical vision of public health. And they delivered on that vision, which in itself is its own miracle. They provide clean water to every settlement of 500 people or more, which is a tremendous accomplishment that has not been mirrored in most of the world. The presence of piped water then became the grounds for new kinds of growth, including a Botswana's diamond mining capacity, because it takes tremendous amounts of water to operate a mine. Meanwhile, as personal wealth grew, more people started connecting to the pipes. They no longer queued at the standpipe with a bucket. Now they would bring water into their yard and eventually even into their homes. They installed flush toilets and filled in their pit latrines. Some began to use washing machines for their laundry and showers to bathe. 
They hosed down their cars to keep them clean. They watered gardens in their yards that belied their desert location. This, here, let me see if I can find it. Oops, let me see. Oh, there we go. It is the Chavaroni Dam. Totally man-made, large enough that you can kayak across it. Very beautiful. It was built and later expanded by the post-colonial state to serve the new capital city and the populous southeastern region of the country. But in the half century since it was built, the drought cycle in the region has escalated under global climate change. So about a decade ago, the dam started drying up. And by 2015, it had sunk below the level necessary to pump water into the pipes. Looks like this. It turns out that even if you have dams and pipes, you might still need a rainmaker. There it is with the city in the back. That's that same um, body where you saw somebody kayaking. Now there are new public health campaigns like this one, and people are often without water for days at a time. In October of 2015, water shortages forced the Central Referral Hospital to turn patients away and suspend key services as relatives rushed to the hospital carrying bottled water for the relatives who were housed there. People were forced to queue at the bowsing trucks to purchase water, now commodified. In September of 2015, Botswana's opposition party took to the streets in an organized march through the capital city of Kavarone to protest this crisis of water. And there was also a related crisis of electricity that they were upset about. Uh, but I won't talk about the electricity with you today. The marchers presented a petition to the office of the president of Botswana that began, and this is a quote, we write as messengers of a weariful, uh, sorry, a weary and tearful nation our people are thirsty, end quote. The ruling party took the, uh, accused the opposition of politicizing the drought. So the president's office responded saying, and this is also a quote, we can build dams, we can drill and equip boreholes, we can lay pipelines and carry water all over as we have done and will continue to do. But if it does not rain, we will always be challenged. The rain is not brought by government, but government, if it rains, will harvest and take water to the people, end quote. The president himself put it more succinctly talking to the press. He was quoted as saying, look, we are not God and we do not make the rain. Well, this was very upsetting to a lot of people. Obviously, such a statement is reasonable, it's technocratic, it's pragmatic. But notice how the scope of political responsibility has narrowed from the time of rainmaking. Government is no longer about creating the forms of collective self-agreement, preventing people from polluting the land, and taking more than their share that are necessary to coax the climate. Government is not about the maintenance of the diversity and health of the animated ecology that is necessary to make the rain. Its temporal metaphysics are manifest in the five-year plan, not in the recognition that rain condenses the past, the present, and the future in its drops. Well, the dam refilled in 2017, so two years later, after huge damaging storms and extensive flooding. It was a La Nina effect that year. Um, but scientists expect that the escalating drought cycle will resume amid rising temperatures, which will increase evaporation, and that certainly is well underway in Botswana. And water consumption, even with many official use restrictions in place, continues to escalate. So the refilling of the dam appears to be a hiatus and not a permanent reversal. Remember this question of water the cornerstone of effective government and well-being as I turn to its twin, food, in this case beef, my next material metaphor. I should say, in order to contextualize this discussion of beef, that for much of the 20th century, the people of Botswana were hungry. 
the demands of, of British colonialism with all of its rapaciousness and its perversions combined with the environmental vagaries of the region to intensify and extend what had been seasonal hunger. So for example, in the 1930s, amid drought and the worldwide economic depression, people would fashion these special leather girdles that they'd wear around their waist and have to pull them tight in order to contain their hunger so that they could function in the absence of food. In the 50s and 60s, malnutrition dominated public health concerns. The fact that this is no longer the case in Botswana is a profound achievement. It's part of what makes Botswana a miracle. Okay, but that said, what about my material metaphor of beef? Well, if rain is the substance of life in Botswana, cattle have long been the subject of desire. People were passionate about their cattle. They composed poetry about them. They sat for hours admiring them as great works of art. People raised and lived with cattle in more mundane ways as the source of the staple food. They used cattle for clothing and building materials, smearing the walls of their house with dung to retard insects and insulate their homes. The well-being of cattle was paramount. Botswana understood that cattle were what I call interspeciated familiars. In other words, they were us, we were them. Whatever you do to cattle, you also do to us and vice versa. That's why one can stand in for the other um, in ritual sacrifice. So for example, you see in this picture um, young men who have dressed themselves as cattle in order to request initiation by their elders into adulthood um, within their community. So Botswana was what anthropologists once called a cattle complex society. Milk was a staple food, beef was eaten only at ritual occasions and festivities, and cattle created the connective tissue that held the social world together by enabling its reproduction through the exchange of cattle in bride wealth, loans, and tribute. This began to change in the 60s and 70s. Cattle became a growth industry. Botswana became Africa's leading beef exporter. Cattle became beef. Most were no longer given names. No poems were written for them. Instead, they've been tagged with numbers and tracked through elaborate systems of public health surveillance required by the global beef market. The national herd has grown exponentially. The size of the bodies of each individual animal has increased. Their life cycle and growth rate has been accelerated through feedlotting and other techniques. Most significantly, their entire life purpose is now oriented toward their death, at which point various parts of their bodies will be distributed across the globe. They're no longer works of art eaten only on special ritual occasions. They are now biotic commodities in a public health operation that monitors them from birth to slaughter, complete with boluses that reside in their third stomach that operate as passports, allowing their flesh to cross borders or not. That system of hygiene at times requires the mass culling of animals by the tens or hundreds of thousands to prevent the spread of disease. Similar to what we saw at the height of the coronavirus pandemic here in the United States when like tens of thousands, I believe, of pigs and possibly cattle were slaughtered because the slaughterhouses got backed up and there simply isn't the carrying capacity to keep those um, uh, animals alive. Even beyond culling, the cattle population is encouraged to grow so quickly that without constant slaughter, cattle outstrip the carrying capacity of the land. So the growth machine is a death machine. This is inside of Botswana's national abattoir, which is a very high-tech uh, facility to meet the EU, uh, designed and operated to meet the EU um, standards for uh, global beef. Um, and it's an expensive one, this death machine. Concentrating the cattle, cattle population in ever fewer hands, such that by the most recent time that I was able to glean the statistics, which was some 15 years ago, 
uh, over two thirds of households no longer owned cattle at all, even as the numbers in the national herd have grown massively. So, you know, 50 years ago, that was unthinkable that two thirds of households would no longer have cattle. Now we have so many more cattle and so many fewer people holding them. Because of the economic growth machine, humans have to eat ever more beef to grease its wheels. Globally, beef consumption escalates. Um, you know what, I think I will get rid of this unpleasant slide and return to this very pleasant image of my face. <laughs> um, because uh, globally, beef consumption escalates at 10 million tons per decade. Meanwhile, the beef market is paradoxical. Um, and by that, I mean that even as the government works to expand market access for Botswana beef, Botswana also imports beef at a rapidly escalating rate. That's the same with many beef countries. Japan exports beef and imports beef. Argentina exports and imports. The US exports beef and imports beef. When you sit down and have Wagyu beef from Japan, it's come into a beef producing country. Um, <clears throat> among Botswana, beef consumption has grown exponentially. So once there was hunger and malnutrition, now there's cardiovascular disease, cancer, and diabetes. The cattle are fatter and more sedentary. They travel by truck. They drink piped water. They carry a passport. So to the people. Again, they are interspeciated familiars. They are us and we are them. This overabundance of food, though, is also contributing to the shortage of water. And herein lies a great danger. As anthropologist Pauline Peters described, starting in the mid 20th century, wealthier Botswana paid to sink boreholes or these very deep wells um, out in the desert. That land is the commons, but people couldn't access it because there was no surface water. So you could drive your cattle across it, but they would die of thirst. So boreholes created a de facto privatization of the rangeland. If you could pay to sink a borehole, then you could manage this entire piece of the veld around it for your cattle. As the number of boreholes has grown, the groundwater is also essentially privatized. And now the cattle are drinking faster than the underground aquifers can recharge. And so the water table is sinking. You know, in the early, or I guess it, actually in the mid to late 90s, I used to work in a village in Botswana where the water table was high enough that people had wells in their backyards and they could have peach trees and banana trees and, and gardens and things. They, they just can't even reach it anymore. It's sunken out of, um, out of their grasp. Meanwhile, growing beef also evaporates the surface water by contributing to increased temperatures through greenhouse gas emissions. Methane from belching, farting bovines is a side effect of beef production. And EU regulations require cattle to be shipped on trucks rather than walking. So animals are immobilized, but their flesh, once it's cut, chilled, or frozen, is sent great distances, even as other lower grade beef from elsewhere cows is sent to Botswana for working class consumption. That entire process of distributing and redistributing the cow through the trade in flesh creates its own waste. The belching and farting of carbon dioxide and myriad toxins, which warm the veld and disperse and dirty the rains. The growth of the national herd has also meant an expansion of cattle into the Kalahari sand veld, which is a delicate ecosystem. There's a series of cordon fences that have been established to prevent the movement of cattle disease, but they also prevent wild animals from migrating. So there have been mass die-offs from dehydration among um, fellow herbivores like sesame, buffalo, wildebeest, zebra, and that has its own uh, effect on the veld. The reduction in the population of those herbivores who browse, by which I mean they eat the woody stalks um, of the brush, combines with the rise in the cattle that eat the little shoots of the grass to change the biodiversity of the plant life in the sand belt. That increases desertification and erodes the delicate pasture. So there's more sand 
and there's less grass, and that in turn also has effects on the aquifer, preventing its recharge and further contributing to the sinking of the water table. The third and final material metaphor I'm going to offer you is about roads. At Independence, Botswana had six kilometers of tarred road in a country the size of France. Now it has about 7,000 kilometers. The first tarred roads were built to transport the cattle. They converged at the abattoir. Since then, they've expanded them to connect to the diamond mines, the large villages and towns with the capital, the country with its neighbors. In 1966, there were 4,300 registered vehicles in a newly independent Botswana. Half a century later, there were some half million. More cars means the need for more roads, bigger, wider roads, and an ever-escalating cycle of transport organized consumption and growth. Roads are the thread that hold together the web of self-devouring growth. They set beef in motion as trucks haul immobilized cattle to the slaughterhouse. They spawn the planned communities, complete with swimming pools and even golf courses that belie Khabaroni's location on the desert shore. They create an ever-expanding commuting class, bringing piped water into their homes, a class whose passion for the car has come to displace the cow as the paradigmatic object of desire. The roads are their own public health problem. As anthropologist Lachlan Jane has argued, automobility hides injury amid its promise of freedom. Even if we leave aside the not insignificant problem of carcinogenic exhaust, the WHO estimates that some one and a quarter million people die in auto crashes every year. Countless more are seriously injured, sometimes with permanent effects. 94% of all those accidents occur in low and middle income countries, even though, as you can imagine, they account for less than half the global stock of vehicles. Africa has more than double the rate of traffic related deaths than Europe. Botswana is in the lead. And perhaps you wouldn't be surprised to hear that deadly car accidents often involve cattle crossing the road. So health economists anticipate crashes as the predictable outcome of self-devouring growth. So too, we know that riding instead of walking contributes to that escalation of cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So death and debility are expected side effects of the growth of roads. They are part of its self-devouring nature. So are the suicides that are driven by the personal debt necessary to grow the car population. But the road itself is not an abstraction. Building a road requires tremendous quantities of water, petroleum, and sand. You already know now that water's in short supply in Botswana. I'm sure you are quite familiar with the like cluster fuck, sorry, I know it's being recorded, that is the global petroleum economy that will kill us all, for which we wage wars. Um, but it also turns out that sand and gravel or aggregate, as they're called in construction, are also finite resources. Humans are using them faster than they can replenish. The largest continual expanse of sand in the world stretches from South Africa to Congo Brazzaville. It traverses Botswana. It covers two thirds of the country. But that kind of sand is not used in construction. Desert sand is formed by wind that gives its edges these kind of uniform or round shape and that prevents it from binding well uh, when you make concrete. And that threatens the long-term structural integrity of what you make with desert sand. So the preference is to use sand that has had water run over it. So you either get it from um, a riverbed or a quarry or from a beach and then wash the saline from it. But as construction rates escalate, aggregate is in short supply. In the late 90s, experts were promoting aggregate mining as having a bright future in Botswana. By 2013, the government warned that sand miners had dug so far into the riverbeds they had created new channels for runoff during that brief season when the water suddenly flows through the otherwise dry riverbed. 
As a result, the rivers don't hold water like they used to. That further deprives the dam downstream, contributes to the water shortage. There's a lot else that I could say about how to value roads in relation to public health, how they fit into this cycle of self-devouring growth. In the book from which uh, my talk is drawn, I look at the ethanol industry in Zimbabwe and the compulsory consumption of biofuels that they have there, like we have in the United States, and how it undermines food supply by drawing vital agricultural land into the monocropping of sugarcane for biofuels while dumping toxins into the groundwater. I also look at the market and use cars that flood into Southern and East Africa from Japan and to the credit economy that underlies that market. Japan exports well over a million used cars a year. That's because Japanese law dictates a regime of extremely rigorous and costly inspection and certification for all vehicles after they've been on the road for three years. And then that has to be repeated every other year. So those regulations help maintain really high standards for vehicle emissions and roadworthiness in Japan. But on the other hand, it's predicated on a consumption cycle that encourages drivers to replace older cars with new ones regularly because the inspection regime is so onerous and costly. And therefore, it's negate all but negated any domestic market for used cars. So then what's Japan to do with or use vehicles if they can't be sold domestically? They're an archipelago of islands. They don't have a lot of landfill space. Therefore, they export their used cars as a necessary and profitable part of Japanese car consumption. Those cars are, locate, are loaded onto containers that are headed overseas on enormous ships that belch the exhaust of sulfur-laden bunker fuel. And so Japan exports its traffic and pollution problems to the global south, where the cars have found a home in places that can't afford those same rigorous emissions and roadworthiness inspection regimes. In order to keep Kyoto's traffic flowing, those cars will break down on Nairobi's already overcrowded roads. For Japanese drivers to conserve with ever more fuel efficient models, Ugandan drivers will consume more petrol and produce more exhaust. And eventually when they finally run their course, they'll be scrapped in a Zambian rather than a Japanese landfill. Osaka's school children will have a clear view across their city. Dar es Salaam's will cough up particulate as they squint through the smog. And yet this is something that probably most Japanese car owners will never even realize. And surely, as a caution against the fantasy that techno solutions can fix the problem of self-devouring growth, we should consider the predations of the cobalt mining economy in the Congo that supplies the substance necessary for lithium batteries. We pour our hopes into technologies to solve the symptoms of a problem whose roots lie far deeper. Certainly, electric cars are better than gasoline-powered ones, but if everyone is to have one and everyone is to want a new one every few years, we will still consume vast quantities of glass, aluminum, plastic, and steel. We will still have a problem of disposing of used tires and brake fluid, of building road capacity, of mining cobalt, nickel, lithium, and graphite to power them. The used car market offers us a chance to reflect on one of the most challenging aspects of self-devouring growth. As soon as the poor, finally get their turn. When Chinese car use begets great clouds of pollution, when working people in Cairo eat great heaps of industrial chicken and beef, those in the know, like we middle class and upper middle class Americans, cry foul. Consumption by the elite and the middle class grows at a rate that dic dictates a disposition toward growth without end. The rich consuming at a rate far greater than any poor person can ever hope to match have dirtied the rains, polluted the sea and air, digested great swaths of life like the sperm whale or the coal-bearing mountain until they wobble on the edge of oblivion 
only to smugly pronounce that something shouldn't be consumed after all, as we go on consuming. Yet the underclass, standing there on the front lines, as they always must do, will get little growth, but are already among the first to be devoured. So what is to be done? Well, surely my point is not to say that the past was glorious and let's all go back there. There used to be periods of frank and pervasive hunger in Botswana. Children died. Women and girls used to walk miles in the heat and cold to draw water and headload it back to their villages. That's not something I intend to wax romantic about. It's not even something I could physically accomplish, much less, uh, you know, wish upon others. Everyone should have water and food. British colonialism and South African apartheid, which I have not had time to mention here, but is no small player in this story, rendered Botswana a migrant labor reserve for South African industry, leaving deep impoverishment in its wake. As the new nation sought to outgrow its poverty, public goods like the diamonds and the water have been acknowledged as a rightful share of common wealth, to use James Ferguson's formulation. Roads, telecommunications, healthcare, electricity, water, education, peace, nature preserves. All this and more has been built. It is a miracle. Botswana is a testament to the tremendous abilities of her people. Were the story to end there, the lesson would be clear, but sadly, it does not. Instead, as you can see, Botswana may soon be in peril. She is gnawing off her own leg to get out of a trap of her own making. We all are. If global temperatures continue to rise in the way that scientists predict, Botswana, like many other places, will have more days of extreme heat, of increasing drought, of food and water insecurity. Scientists caution that the spectacular Okavango Delta, the hub of Botswana's high-end ecotourism industry, the nation's second largest income earner, site of some of the earliest human societies on our planet, planet will lose its biodiversity as flooding and water distribution patterns shift and the water table drops. The day will eventually arrive when, like the quarry sand and the groundwater, the diamonds that propelled Botswana's climb out of poverty are finished. In the fall of 2017, and I am winding up, I promise you, I sat watching reports on television of the devastating aftermath of Hurricane Harvey in Texas, and you all may have seen some of these same reports. A reporter stood outside an oil refinery in Port Arthur and marveled at the destruction of homes, the precarious and overwhelming situation in which the working poor residents of this city found themselves. But he didn't turn around and look at the refinery itself. He didn't say this refinery is part of a global petrochemical network that helped foster changes in our climate that brought this storm down upon it. Nor did he note that this refinery was carcinogenic to those who lived and worked in its shadow, that it bled chemicals like carbon monoxide or that benzene had washed into the floodwaters. He didn't know if he had driven to the scene in a gasoline powered van, nor look into the camera and say to me in the comfort of my living room that I too likely use the fuel and the chemicals produced in this city. The fuel and the chemicals that killed those workers, albeit very slowly. His report was a spectacle, not a parable like mine. In order to apprehend and face the enormity of our predicament, we must stop cleaving our dreams and our nightmares asunder, such that the side effects and the desired effects of consumption-driven growth are considered in isolation from one another. Food, water, movement, all are necessary to human and other vital forms of life. All are cornerstones of health all our complex relationships rather than resources that exist in isolation. Recognizing as much is necessary to understanding how our world has become self-devouring. 
the animated ecology is not a bank from which we can compete to extract. It is a living manifestation of myriad ongoing historical relationships. It is a future we create every single day in the present. What happens when we eviscerate our animated ecology? What use are our ancestors in such a world? What use will we be when we become those ancestors? What if the end is nigh but for a major rethinking and reorientation of human activity? And yet how is one to argue for less, even if self-devouring growth is the force that is undermining collective well-being? How is one to argue for less when not nearly everyone yet has enough? What political form can again take hold, however tentatively, of the clouds, the sun, and the rain? What would rainmaking on a planetary scale entail? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> We have a few questions um, both in the uh, chat, but I also encourage all of you to ask uh, as we go along. Um, uh, I don't know, Jeff, maybe you want to read your own question or would you like me to do it? I think it's better. Uh, oh, sure. I'd be happy to read my own question. Um, um, uh, thank you, Dr. Livingston, uh, for your talk. Um, I. I um, as someone who's doing research on indigenous cultural practices of resistance against ecological ruination, I'd be curious to know um, in your research uh, on, on the people of Botswana, um, how uh, and if they may have organized, right, to resist um, the ruinous effects of extractive and consumer capitalism that is self-devouring growth. Um, so my question is, you know, it's one of curiosity. Um, to know what what are these, since you mentioned um, political forms, right? Um, how can we think of these political forms as aesthetic and cultural um, practices of opposition and resistance, right? To bring to the world's attention, um, you know, the effects of this ecological ruination um, on their lands. Um, so that that's my question. I'm, I'm curious to know about that. Uh, okay, I'm not muted. Great. Uh, thank you so much for your um, question. Can I ask where it is that you, where geographically the work you do is? Oh, the the um, the work that I do is in uh, primarily the uh, in the Pacific Islands, um, and I'm currently working on a book that is uh, I'm I'm in the I'm in the humanities, and I work in literature, um, uh, and so I'm writing a book and I'm look, currently looking at aesthetic and cultural forms of indigenous Pacific Islanders and how they're confronting um, climate change um, and ecological ruination. That's of course connected to um, centuries of colonialism and, and imperialist invasion and occupation on their lands. Absolutely. Um, thank you and thank you for that um, explanation. I would say that uh, the the deepest and most protracted um, examples of that form or those forms of political organizing and resistance which take cultural, legal, and political um, expression in Botswana are by the um, quote-unquote Bushman populations, which is a, an ethnic subgroup of autochthonous people who were colonized by Botswana when they moved onto the High Veld um, during a series of migrations that were at least in part set in motion by the European slave trade on um, the southern uh, coast, east and west, um, in southern Africa, uh, the Cape, and then also in Lorenzo Marx and what's now Mozambique. Um, and so there are multiple African populations there, one of which came and was essentially, you know, the term doesn't exactly fit, but the closest way to understand them was a settler colonial population that then um, displaced and in some cases um, 
uh, enslaved the indigenous um, Bushmen and then cast them as an ethnic or racial underclass in their population. Um, and they continue, they've been pushed onto marginal lands, uh, what is not dissimilar to what you see happening in, under settler colonialism in the US or Australia um, or um, for, to First Nations people in Canada. Um, and there's an anthropologist named Pierre Duplessis who is at Arvis University in, um, in uh, Denmark and who has written a, just an absolutely exquisite dissertation looking at, um, at some of this um, uh, in great detail in Botswana. So I would um, refer you to his work because I think that's the most uh, protracted and deepest expression of that kind of um, resistance. Otherwise, you definitely see environmental activists, um, labor activists, people who want um, to, uh, who oppose corruption, who want um, uh, kind of more leveling, economically leveling policies within society who might promote something like a basic income grant, etc. So there are people who are picking around at, at different elements of the system of self-devouring growth and the ways that it can be um, corrosive to democracy. But in terms of expressing that larger metaphysical vision um, it, in its um, cultural forms, I think that 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 you find that um, the most among those people in the Kalahari. Um, uh, and I think that Pierre Duplessis is the one who writes about them um, in the deepest uh, and probably um, most, most relevant ways to your interest. Thank you very much for that recommendation and, and your answer. Thank you. Thank you. We have, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a question here from one of our global um, uh, majors, our undergraduates, Mohona Siddiqui, is asking uh, what are the gendered impacts of this form of self-devouring growth? Maybe you can uh, comment on that. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Uh, I think that the gendered impacts are you know, the entire system, like all political and economic systems, are highly gendered. Um, so they're shot through, but I can name a, a few of them just to begin to think about. The provision of water for domestic use is something that is often the work of women. So you're talking about adding a tremendous amount of um, work and need for capital when people are having to buy commodified water that is falling disproportionately on um, women who are household heads or who occupy responsibility for the domestic um, functioning and provision for children within their homes. And you can see that in relationship to water. Women are also um, the farmers in most of the African continent. Um, so when conditions change that make um, agriculture less viable, more precarious, et cetera, women bear the brunt of that um, disproportionately. And we've seen that kind of downward spiral happening around the productivity of, um, of domestic agriculture for subsistence um, in Botswana uh, for a while now, which I think are effects of this system of self-devouring growth, absolutely. Um, I think that the other thing that, or you know, other places that you can see it, for example, are um, like a element of it that I've written about, and this is um, from like the margins of it, but it maybe helps you understand how extensive it could be. Once you get compulsory consumption around the automobile, you have a lot of problems on your hands. We can see that in the US where the automobile is a tool of impoverishment of working poor people who have to have a car in order to work, but of course it's this big money sink. And in Botswana, there are many people for whom a car is a necessary sign of status that they um, 
are using in order to parlay into entrepreneurial or business opportunities, et cetera, as are other forms of um, conspicuous consumption that operate under that kind of compulsory consumption model. And Botswana is a place where um, the majority of women uh, do not get married. There are a lot of single-headed households. It's been that way for many, many decades. So you have a situation where often men are um, giving gifts to their girlfriends of cash or of consumer goods as part of instantiating their relationship. And then if the woman breaks up with him, this man um, is resentful and upset about the debt that he has taken on to produce that conspicuous consumption that is necessary to the relationship and he feels owed something um, and there are very, uh, there have been many spectacular incidents of and political outcry about the problem of murder um, suicide that locks women into relationships that they no longer want to be in because they're afraid um, of the violent implications of it. I certainly do not intend to single out uh, Botswana as being a particularly violent society. I am an American and I'm well aware that we are so much more violent than they would ever be. So that's not a, a cultural assessment. It's just of what happens when you get those forms of capital, debt, money lending, and conspicuous and compulsory consumption um, running through relationships in that form. Okay, I have uh, one more, no, I have several more questions. One of them is from my colleague, Shimelis, Dr. Shimelis Kulema from Africana Studies. And he says, thank you very much for a very important presentation. This is something that is happening all over the continent and beyond. My question is about the very title of the presentation itself. How self is this self-devouring growth, especially in light of how the global economy works and the peripheral position of Africa, Botswana included in the global economic system? That, thank you for that question. It's such a important question. And I will certainly say that one of the regrets I have about the book that I've published is I don't feel that I have tended to that absolutely critical question as thoroughly and um, as forcefully as I wish that I had in retrospect. I felt like I was as I was writing it, but once you have distance from it and you read it afresh, you're like, ooh, nope, that's a little minor problem there. Not minor. Um, what I'm trying to say when I use the metaphor to say that, um, when I say the self and I say the super organism of human beings, I'm trying to suggest that we need one another. We can't go it alone. We are um, one larger entity and a larger entity that is interpenetrated um, with and interdependent upon all the other entities that make up our world. But when I say that Botswana is gnawing off her leg to get out of a trap of her own making, I'm talking about that superorganism. And I find that people who are poor who are disproportionately black and brown, who disproportionately find themselves in the global south or particularly on the African continent are that leg that is being eaten off, that leg that is being sacrificed. And that um, is obviously and really and truly wrong. And we see the um, escalation of the self-devouring nature of it so starkly on the African continent right now as the zero-sum game of resource extraction is reaching its zenith. There is a consumption of the continent um, in ways that we, I believe anyway, we haven't fully seen since we saw, you know, that magnificent cake and these European, uh, you know, assholes are just like dividing it up like a goodie bag. Um, you know, look at what's happening in the Mono River region where you have people who had collective land rights, just having the land sold out from under them, clear cut um, and planted into rectilinear um, oil palm 
plantations to serve global industry. And not surprisingly, that's part of the background of the Ebola epidemic. Um, so I absolutely uh, um, agree with what I think is implied in your point that not everybody is situated in this, in this to the same degree of vulnerability, nor is consuming at the same rate um, as everybody else. And that um, is manifest in this kind of rapacious consumption of resources that's taking place in Africa and the ways that we see people on the African continent, particularly smallholders, fishers, farmers, um, etc., really just being um, on the front lines of, of global climate change. Look at the locust um, invasion, um, you know, a few months ago in East Africa that just decimated the food crop. Look at the flooding that's going on uh, right now. You know, uh, what was it like a few months ago, uh, Dakar got an entire year's worth of rain in a day. So, sorry, I'll, I'll stop. Uh, can I just piggyback for Please. one second on Chimelis's point? I think there's a tension here between, uh, let's call it Wallerstein and world system theory. Ironically, Wallerstein, I think, in the beginning was an Africanist, uh, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Not ironically, uh, yes. <laughs> okay, oh, not ironically, but, you know, but the kind of uh, a very clear focus on structures of power and so on and so forth, which in Wallerstein become a little bit kind of, you know, structural as the theory goes. And I'm listening to you and I'm reminded of, of work that I've done with Ulrich Beck, uh, who talks about wealth with society, uh, where the dynamic and the charges against Beck have always been, where's power, where the actors, this is all kind of self-enclosed. I think this, so there's a conceptual tension. Of course, you know that there are powers and interests and so on and so forth, but I think that was what Schimmel was in part alluding to, that the self itself, it, become, it can, there's a tendency, it could become a reified category. Does it do it itself? And I think they have to be brought together um, in, in whatever ways. So, I don't know if I that think makes sense. I think that's so well put. I totally agree. I think that's absolutely right. And yet there's something that I'm trying to tap into, which is, or, and trying to, people I'm trying to communicate with who are the, you know, vast, vast numbers of human beings who are caught up in and perform this system but can't find the, the soft spot to knock on, the rotten place to open out and overturn it and turn it into something else. So instead we get these kind of piecemeal technological solutions or we get people who are very focused on uh, one problem, which is an important problem, but not the problem that is, it is linked to etc. So it's been my intention to kind of just help people visualize that um, web of interaction so that they can see how if you pull up one piece, all these other pieces are tied to it. And so much of that gets smuggled in under this um, ideology of growth, which obviously is bullshit and premised on a kind of trickle down and all the rest of it. Um, which is corrosive to democracy and forms of governance, and at the same time keeps this kind of aspirational look upward without putting a, a ceiling on top of it. Constitutive of capitalism, but also of empire, and also to be seen even in putatively non-capitalist um, settings. So I, I think you have hit the nail on the head, but there's that ephemeral nature of it that I want um, readers to be able to see. So then they can start seeing it everywhere. Mm -hmm. Great, and we have two more, um, thank you. We have two more comments um, or questions. I'm gonna bundle them because they are somewhat similar. One is from um, Christina. Uh, she's asking, what sparked your interest towards studying economic systems in African nations? And the second one, and somewhat related, is by Brooke Lowndes, who says, I was really impressed from your cogent understanding of the water table system in Botswana. Can you speak to your research process to begin to understand water systems? Did you approach scientific, your research from an anthropological perspective? In other words, the methodological kind of tell us a little bit about this. 
Sure. Um, I will say I've worked in Botswana on and off for a long time. Um, and uh, my previous work has been much more tightly focused in the history of the body and um, very uh, kind of fine-grained, um, intimate uh, ethnography. So this is a little bit of a shift in register for me, but you really can't understand medicine and public health without understanding it as an expression of an economic system. So understanding economic systems in Africa has always been a, a, a piece of, a necessary piece of what I do even when I've been focused more specifically on um, the human body and its uh, vulnerabilities. For this particular book, um, I didn't intend to write a book, I didn't intend to really do much of anything, but I got invited um, to a, a week-long like seminary thing, I don't know what you want to call it, it was called the Johannesburg Workshop in Theory and Criticism that um, Ashil Mbembe and uh, Julia Hornberger and a bunch of people used to run at the University of Witwatersrand. And they asked me, would I give a talk for it, a seminar? Um, and the theme for the larger workshop was on happiness, techni, and bios. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll do something about rainmaking because rain um, and happiness are connected uh, in Botswana. And I really didn't know where it would lead. But as I started doing it, I started um, thinking about how rainmaking worked. And then I started looking at how the dam worked. And then before you knew it, I was like, whoa, what is happening? Um, so I um, taught myself along the way how the water table and the water systems and whenever work by reading a lot of um, technical literature, which over time I was able to make sense of, though early on I made some um, mistakes and there was this really lovely anthropology grad student at um, Stanford, uh, Dean Shaheem, who writes about water in Mexico City, um, really fantastic work, who um, when I had kind of missed, you know, was off in a corner, was like, no, this, this is what, how to go about it and um, how to conceptualize what you're doing. So I did get some um, assistance and advice from people, but basically if you read through the technical literature, you understand the technical problem. And I'll say as a historian of medicine and science, we're trained to do that. But if you can read Derrida, you can read, which I can't, you can read <laughs> the hydrologists with no problem, right? <laughs> I, I don't mean to usurp my uh, position as moderator and monopolize this, but I'm, I'm so, your talk is so evocative. There's so many questions. Uh, I was wondering, um, I, I understand of course the problem that you're describing and I wonder to what extent are you also engaging not just with the ecological fallout, but uh, to what extent are you situating it in or should I say, in the, the literature on development. Uh, and what I'm thinking about here is you have the 50s and 60s modernization theory from the West, mostly uh, driven by us academics and really kind of pace, creating fantasies, creating aspirations, expectations, obviously we know how that worked out. And uh, now we have globalization and we have these kind of, how should I say, a creation of desires, images of consumption that didn't exist. Back then it was give us education, now it's give us Gucci uh, or whatever it is. Uh, uh, so uh, are, you, are you talking about that in the book a little bit in terms of aesthetic? I mean, it goes back a little bit maybe to Eric's question about aesthetic and cultural practices and desires and so on and so forth. Yes, um, and you see some of that in the details by which I talk about the move from the cow to the car or the types of food that people used to have as a daily meal as versus the desire for the hamburger and the processed um, food. Um, what I thought you were going to say when you said, you know, interested in the history of development, which again, since I look at uh, public health and the body in Southern Africa, I look at development, that's, you know, those are, again, 
part of the same um, problem. I thought you were going to say the Club of Rome and the degrowth movement and the population bomb and all the rest of it. And this is really um, uh, part of a new wave of scholarship that follows up those concerns, but but tries to rethink and reiterate them on less um, rocky terms, let's say, without the Malthusian um, mm -hmm. turn or the point uh, to reproduction. So, for example, the uh, theorist from Buen Vivir, or to look at what, um, look at how Jacinda Arden um, in New Zealand, I mean, she basically has a degrowth model of um, development and governance. I'm not saying it's necessarily successful, but the benchmarks are not about the economy growing. The benchmarks are about how many children have been taken out of poverty this year. The benchmarks are about things that have to do with human development, not about the economy um, itself. Uh, and you see that too um, with the Buen Vivir uh, theorists and then with some of the policies um, in Ecuador and Bolivia, which is not to say that, you know, they're so wildly successful or not, but it is a change of conversation and in the... Um, where the goalposts are, how the problem and the solution are being conceptualized. Yes. Any other questions? If not, then I would like to thank Professor Livingston for this very, very uh, evocative and interesting um, presentation. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, we hope to see you in the future. If there are any events, we will definitely share the information with you and vice versa. And um, thank you all for coming. I don't know if Sophie has anything else to say uh, as yes. a last word. Okay. Yes, of course. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, first of all, for moderating the discussion with, with uh, um, Julie, and thank you so much, Julie, for this uh, very um, passionate um, plea that you, you made in, in shape of a, of a talk for us. Um, and um, I would like to ask you a last question from um, uh, Institute of Globalization Studies perspective and in the context of this very event, which is uh, the inaugural event where you are the keynote speaker that we have chosen. And I know that um, a few of our new majors are, are here with us, but we also uh, here in this enterprise um, trying to find our way. Um, and uh, because you are our first um, uh, speaker, our first guest, I would like to hear what you may have to say to these students and to us who are in this uh, globalization studies enterprise as to um, why we should study globalization, why we should be interested in these issues. And um, can you please just enlighten us? Um, Absolutely. I'll say to your students, those who might uh listen to this recording after, or if there are any who are left here now. I'm 54 years old, and I'm sorry. We failed you. We are handing you a problem that is enormous. You will have to live through it. We did not solve this problem, though we saw it. Our parents did not solve this problem, though they saw it. Many of us have benefited from it. And there you are. Now we're putting it in your lap. Like it or not, you are the ones who are going to have to find your way to the further shore and create a safe harbor there. And first of all, I just want to apologize on behalf of the people of my generation and my parents' generation. I'm sorry, we did this. We are responsible. I don't think you will be able to find your way to the further shore and to do it without ever increasing rates of violence unless you understand this as a global problem, 
as a global system, as a planetary predicament. Unless you are able to create and find a global coalition of like-minded people, curious, interested people who are willing to find new forms of cooperation and working together. Tunneling down into the local is a worthwhile thing to do, but ultimately we are stuck in a global game and we live on a planet together. I really do think we're a super organism. And if you are not to either be eating off the limb that is someone else or to be eaten in that manner, then I think it is very much worth your time to learn absolutely everything that you can at Stony Brook and <laughs> in the Institute of Globalization Studies. Unfortunately, I think you're going to need it. And I hope that you are able to put it to good ends. Well, thank you so much, Julie. Thank you. And I want to give the opportunity to anyone else who might have a last question uh, or want to comment on uh, Judy's message here. Yeah, amen. Amen? Yes. I don't think we can add anything to this. So I will be very mundane and um, we'll say uh, goodbye and adjourn on the on a more practical uh, note to remind our SBU community and to our um, viewers here that tomorrow is um, Giving Day at Stony Brook. Uh, giving Day for a good cause, for the cause of our students. Um, here's the info and um, um, if anybody is interested in participating in um, in uh, the life of our institute in helping this new cohort of students who are uh, wanting to make a difference in the world. Um, as Julie has indicated, uh, that there is room uh, for them to do so. Uh, please uh, think about it and, and do your share. I want to thank everybody here today for um, being part of this inaugural for giving us the support, the moral support that we need and to give us uh, the desire to, to offer a more um, uh, initiative like this one. I hope Julie will be uh, staying in touch and will continue to be inspired by, uh, by, by you and, and, uh, and your hopes. Um, and I think uh, I can uh, just stay until next time. So for those of you interested, I hope you will continue to be our base and uh, we will plan another um, lecture uh, before the end of the term. Uh, and in between, we're organizing, we're trying to organize a panel, a faculty panel, um, and you will be, so stay tuned, you will be uh, receiving information about it, okay? I just want to say good night. Thank you again, Julie. It was Thank a you. real pleasure. Thank you, uh, mine as well. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you, Bye. everybody.